Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me. I'm Tracy Harris, and this is At Home in My Head, the podcast that explores experience and meaning and their impact on individuals and the broader society. After reading The Case Against Free Speech by P.E. Moskowitz, I felt inspired to dedicate a few episodes to what they were pointing out. But I also found myself looking at information in a whole new way, which I think was their goal, to get me to look up and actually see what's happening around me, on more than just a superficial level. Instead of just absorbing information being thrown at me, Maybe take a second look at something if it seems off, or if it starts to come up more and more. Ask why. Ask who's behind it. Ask who benefits and who suffers. I honestly have a hard time remembering what I've talked about and what I haven't. Which notes on my page are notes I've already gone over, and which didn't make the final cut into an episode. So I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but free speech is no different than any weapon or shield in that it can be used to help or to harm. The problem is that, like all weapons and shields, all of them are always much more available to those with resources than to those without. So the people who need them most have the least access to them. I keep gravitating back to the example of people who are unhoused, not because of some fixation with that group, but because they're about as marginalized as a group can get literally left to struggle for basic needs, access to things like shelter, food, clean water, clothing, hygiene products, they have nothing of material value, and what they do have is often stripped from them in raids on camps and laws disallowing them to even exist in public spaces. Their lives are survival. If anyone has motive to want to change this system, I would say people living on the margins are those people. And people dealing with housing insecurity are about as far into the margins as you can get on just about every level. Who stands to benefit the most from access to levers of power and social change? The people who are disenfranchised, living in the streets in fear and deprivation, obviously. And they are, not by accident, the very people our society disempowers the most. Why would people in this situation, who need social support, be entirely divorced from power, even up to and including their votes? These are the people who should have the most access to a vote, and they're stripped of it. More than half a million people, as far into the margins as we can possibly throw someone, who don't have access to basic necessities, also don't have access to the votes needed to even participate in how the society functions. How is that just? Every now and then, someone who is marginalized finds a way to use levers of power to their advantage. But generally, it takes more resources than they have. So unless they get the attention of a group like the ACLU, they're out of luck. If you can independently afford legal fees needed to fight a battle with the government or a corporation in a fair fight, you probably aren't as oppressed as you think you are. I'm not saying you don't have problems, but are you really divorced from survival resources if you've got that kind of coin? So when we see the little guy actually win, it's only because a much bigger guy got behind him. And that much bigger guy is coming from a place that operates from money as well. And so there's a question of even which cases are chosen and why. And this brought me to something called the nonprofit industrial complex. The way this model works is this activists often work for or with the backing of nonprofits. And any real social change goals will require support that is heavily depending on financial resources. You can't achieve large-scale social change without resources that can only be obtained through financial backing. And any nonprofit group needs to be registered with the government 
if they want to be legally allowed to receive large-scale donations. Even smaller nonprofits are often grant recipients or somehow funded in some other way by a larger nonprofit. And at some point, it's going to be connected to large capital, generally in the form of a large business entity and wealthy people who control capital at an industry level. And since social change requires a critical look at the current system, a literal eye to dismantle it and replace it with something better, either in part or in whole, that means that activists who want to use capital to affect change have to actually pull capital from the people who are succeeding the most under the status quo system. So the greater the social change your goals require, the less likely you are to get access to the resources needed to affect that change because people with resources like the system as it is because it benefits them more than anyone else. Social change for them means sacrificing privilege. They won't starve, but they'll have to let go of some of the benefits of their privilege under the current system. And that's not something they're going to want to finance. Dean Spade, an activist and founder of Sylvia Rivera Law Project, explains it like this. The reality is philanthropy is a system that allows rich people to maintain control of their wealth. Instead of having it be taxed, they can put it into a foundation, which is still a bank account that they get to control what happens to. End quote. In other words, they're still controlling the money, But now, instead of the people voting to elect a governmental system that distributes tax dollars in a way that the people decide, the wealthy have found a way to subvert the tax system, maintain control of their money, making themselves the arbiters of who gets help, who is deserving, taking that control out of the hands of society and putting it into the hands of the 1%. Because of this, If a group working for change wants to keep money coming in, they have to reduce some of their social goals for social change in order to be more acceptable to an industrial business complex that sees no benefit to funding any effort that will threaten its own dominance. And I say this as someone who does do what I can in all areas. I vote, even though I know voting isn't going to create the change that's needed. I work for and support nonprofits, even though I know they aren't going to create the change that's needed. Ultimately, no slice of the capitalist pie is going to create the system wide change needed to fix the systemic problems we are experiencing. It all has to change. And so it needs to be hit on multiple fronts, not here or there, but everywhere, because a system that values itself isn't going to allow itself to be dismantled and replaced. Under the current system, after having it for over two centuries, we have half a million unhoused people and 17 million vacant homes. If we wanted to fix this, it wouldn't be hard. The solution is staring us in the face, and we won't take the steps necessary to make it happen. Under the current system, We can't figure out how to end slavery and involuntary servitude after more than two centuries. We are told that the system was set up to change and evolve. But creating amendments is near impossible. And even when they're passed, the problems they're supposed to fix don't go away. After ending chattel race-based slavery, we left the door open to enslave people who were imprisoned. So then we passed the black codes to keep, quote, free, unquote, black people working on plantations. If they tried to leave, they'd be arrested, and their punishment would be to go back and work the plantation as a prisoner. When black codes were outlawed, we passed Jim Crow. When Jim Crow fell, we made the racist war on drugs and implemented racist segregationist policies without mentioning race, the Southern strategy. And no amount of time or amendments to our evolving constitution has actually brought about racial equity, even though racial inequity 
is technically against the law. And as I've talked about before, if you want those laws enforced, you get to pay for the privilege of going after the person who violated you with your own time, your own money, your own lawyers, which once again makes this sort of justice less available to those who need it the most. The harder the knee is on your neck, the less our laws are there to protect you. So all of it, including free speech, is a bit like a gun in a setting where only the person trying to murder you has one. Sure, now and then you're going to see someone successfully wrestle that gun away from the hands of the privileged and use it against the oppressors, but most often it's going to be used to murder you, not to save your life. That's our system. And with that stuck in my head, I've been seeing information in a whole new light, and I'd like to go through some examples. The first one is kind of a crossover between then and now, history and the present. It's an article about a historic figure. Every now and then, I come across a figure I learned about in school, and I find new information about them that wasn't part of the lessons. In the past, I would just think, new facts. But these aren't newly discovered facts. They're facts that were not included in the stories when I was in school learning about these historic figures. So, for example, today there's a lot of talk about including more LGBT plus accomplishments in history with more than just a lesson here or there. What I didn't know was that I was already learning about these communities' contributions. It was just part of the speech we withheld. So, I didn't know that's what I was learning. And now I can ask who drew those lines and why? Who benefited from what I wasn't taught? And seeing how history today is being silenced and why, I'm going to suggest that the history I learned was also edited more than I realized, not just Thomas Jefferson. I don't know how black U.S. history is taught these days, It's been a lot of years since I was in a classroom, especially for primary or secondary school. But I was pretty young when I learned about George Washington Carver. My basic memory was that he was a black man who worked with peanuts and came up with the idea of crop rotation. He also came up with a lot of uses for peanuts. I can't really remember why I looked him up recently, but there was a lot about his life that I'd never learned. Bear in mind that it wasn't unusual to learn about the personal lives of white historic figures, not just their accomplishments. I did not know the details, but I did know, for example, that Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. I knew that George Washington's wife was Martha Washington. President Kennedy's wife was the iconic Jackie Kennedy. We learned Lincoln had humble beginnings, And sure, we certainly didn't learn about the private lives and personal relationships of every figure in history. It's completely fair to say that. But how many figures did I learn about who weren't straight or cis? And why are the people outside of the privileged and powered classes generally only celebrated for pushing back against the state to try and gain rights, or for contributions that amount to assimilation? productivity as defined by a classist capitalist system. For example, women were generally tasked with honing skills in order to make things by hand that were often taken and then industrialized and patented by men with access to capital and power and connections. The largest companies that make soap products or frozen dinners or clothing are all owned and run by men. Paul Mollov, CEO, Noel Wallace, white and male. Procter & Gamble CEO John Mueller, white and male. I googled to see what the largest frozen dinner manufacturer in the U.S. was. It's listed as Stouffer's, and when I google that, it's a subsidiary of Nestle. So I google for the Nestle CEO, and it's Ulf Mark Schneider, another white male. When I google for Palm Olive and Procter & Gamble, I had no idea what I'd find. It was random. But it's an interesting game. Look for the top companies in any huge money industries, and you can guess they're white and male with an incredible accuracy. Heck, remember that campaign at Dove a while back about how every woman's body is beautiful? 
I Google Dove to see who owns it. It's Unilever. So I Google for the CEO of Unilever. And guess what? The person on top of the company, making money hand over fist, selling soap to women, the very people who made it throughout history until it was industrialized and monetized by the people who kept women away from capital and power, is a white man named Alan Jope. I check top clothing manufacturers. Nike was the first one that I saw. CEO, John Donahoe, white and male. But then I saw that actually TJX was number one, a company I hadn't heard of. For a brief moment, I thought it might have a woman CEO, but the current CEO is a white man, Ernie Herman. You can literally do this all day long. The Society Pages is an open access social science project headquartered in the Department of Sociology at the University of Minnesota and supported by individual donors. In October 2020, they ran an article entitled Fortune 500 CEOs, 2000 to 2020, Still Male, Still White. And in that article, they compiled stats on demographics of CEOs and reported as follows. Quote, The big picture is that almost 90% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are still white males. As can be seen in Figure 1, the slow increase in new CEOs from a total of 19 in 2000 to 71 in 2020 has been accompanied by a corresponding steady decrease in the number of white male CEOs. Still, the white men, who make up about 35% of the population, continue to be very much overrepresented. And the gap between them and the new CEOs is still immense. White men may have lost power, but they continue to be the dominant group in the corporate elite. They held 96.4% of the Fortune 500 CEO positions in 2000 and still hold 85.8% in 2020. Moreover, since most of these seats lost by white men were lost to white women, and white women make up 6.8% of those who are now CEOs, whites still make up 92.6% of the Fortune 500 CEOs. Only 1% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are African Americans. 2.4% are East Asians or South Asians. And 3.4% are Latinx. Unquote. Okay, but where am I even going with this? Weren't we talking about history and George Washington Carver and education? Yes, we were. And I want to circle back to just say that we have a nation, and I think it's fair to say a world, that is very male-centric and dominated by a colonialist, classist framework. Capitalism is about expansion and exploitation. And a quote I heard recently that really made my heart sing was, quote, recognizing that the patent system is how white people colonize intellectual property, unquote. We tend to see great accomplishment not to be about skill, but about capacity to exploit and gatekeep power to maintain classism and capitalism. When women were making soap and clothing, it was mainly unpaid labor done as household maintenance. In general, they lacked access to education, money, and connections to the power needed to do something like industrialize these products. Their skills were seen as valueless. Soap making was mainly unpaid labor until someone found a way to exploit it by leveraging their unique access to money and power that the artisans, the women, weren't allowed. And to this day, Men are making huge sums of money selling soap to women who used to make it for this nation for free. But when did you ever hear a lesson celebrating soap making by hand? So the skilled artisans who were mainly women are not celebrated or rewarded or even remembered. But the brands built by men who had the unique access to power and money to appropriate the skill and make it into a for-profit endeavor now are household names and billion-dollar multinational companies headed by men. So to bring that around to Moskowitz and the question of who draws the lines and why, I would note that someone has decided 
that doing skilled labor for free is not something to celebrate, but taking a skill from people who aren't able to exploit it for money and using your access to money and power to monetize it and capitalize on the industry for profit is celebrated as an accomplishment. So I haven't been watching much TV, but the other day I decided to just watch a few minutes of MSNBC's morning show. After several minutes of commercials, it finally comes on, and it's Mika Brzezinski, who at least half the time gets feminism wrong. And she didn't disappoint. She's celebrating Women's History Month by showing segments from something called the 3050 Summit, which is supposed to be about women's empowerment, and was ironically held in Abu Dhabi. She's on the show talking about what a great uplifting experience it was to be at an event with so many successful women. And my first thought is, what about the women who struggle? Do they matter? Do they have value without this success as you measure it? And it's like she read my mind because they showed footage immediately after I thought that of Mika herself leading a huge audience of affluent, well-dressed women in this chant that she was promoting. She's on stage shouting, I am not ashamed, and it's all about the money. She then encourages the audience to join her in shouting again, Say it with me, I am not ashamed, and it's all about the money. This system that she's assimilating into, and encouraging other women to assimilate into, is propped up by using male-centric models of success based on productivity, profit, capitalism, and classism. It is not healthy for anyone and has traditionally not been healthy for women or AFAB people along with all other people it has marginalized, often to death. And rather than dismantle it, she's trying to out-exploit the top exploiters She's just propping up male power and enlisting women to participate in a violent system where we're all only as valuable as we are profitable or productive. A system that treats anyone who can't work or be exploited in some way as dead weight. Because we literally, in this country, are expected to earn a right to eat and be housed and to literally exist and be alive. Anyone in our country who isn't making money can just die as far as this system is concerned, and we have no other celebrated value. Mika isn't unique in seeing this as what makes a woman valuable. How well that woman can assimilate into that violent structure and work it as well as these men. But she isn't asking why this system and this version of success is not just the main one, but seems to be the only one. Why is she letting these men in power tell her this is the only way to be empowered and respected as a woman? Rather than standing up to them, she's becoming one of them. So, I'm somewhere in elementary school or middle school, and I'm reading this scant lesson on the contributions of black citizens, and it's George Washington Carver and peanuts and crop rotation and hooray for the U.S. farmer and industry. And decades later, I'm online for some reason I can't remember, looking him up for something, and I start to read more about his life. And as I'm reading, I see he was born into slavery. And I have this hazy recollection of having learned that. Post-slavery, he managed to gain access to education, but it was a constant struggle due to his race and segregation. He was the first black student at Iowa State University. And after graduating, he went on to pursue a master's degree. He was motivated to study plants, and especially as it related to agriculture. He also became their first black faculty member, and when people today ask, why does first black matter? Why don't we just celebrate the first? Well, it's because people like Carver first had to be recognized as humans, then to find a way to access education, and his white counterparts didn't face those barriers thrown up due to race. So first and black matters when you live in a society where the goal is for no black person to gain this access. 
but we're still celebrating his success with all this system of oppression that defines success in ways that mainly benefit the people in power who don't have to struggle for access to these same social benefits. And when we look at the top CEOs today, we see nothing much has changed. It's still being gatekept. Someone told me recently that if I consider these sorts of social contexts that people have to contend with, that I'm coddling them. I'm infantilizing them, which makes me wonder, first of all, how much does this person actually respect young humans, children, infants? But when I realize someone has to come up through slavery and foster care and walk 10 miles to get to a school to be rejected by colleges all because he's black and people who aren't black don't have to deal with this, they just go to the local school and get into whatever college because there are no educational barriers in place to stop you from attending because of your race if you're born white. They are literally suggesting I not consider someone's context. We have a word for not considering someone's context, and that's called inconsiderate. He's literally saying that we should be inconsiderate to other people and to quote him, quote, treat everyone the same, unquote. I had a friend provide a great analogy for this a long time ago. If four people are hiking in the woods and one gets a cut, and they open the first aid kit and there are two bandages, what should they do? Should they cut the two bandages in half and provide each person with half a bandage? Of course not, that would be ludicrous. You provide the bandage to the person with the cut. Equality is about treating everyone the same. And it doesn't work, because our contexts are not the same. And when I know how my society treats a particular demographic, I should respect that context. I should be considerate of it. It's not coddling a person. It's simply being a considerate human being. When I give the bleeding person a whole bandage and I put the other bandage back in the kit, I'm respecting the context of everyone there. Only one of us was harmed, so only one of us needs a bandage. The rest of us do not need a bandage for what should be obvious reasons. Our society makes some people bleed more than others. It made Carver bleed a lot. There's a quote I've heard that says something like, a black person has to fly where a white person can walk. That was inarguably true of Carver. But the flip side that Mika is missing is that those who can only walk are in no way less than those who only have to walk. They are the same. They are just in very different circumstances. The fact they don't meet Mika's metrics for success is not due to a personal failing. It's not because they need more personal empowerment. It's because we set some people up for failure, and also we don't offer any alternative methods of success. There is one path, profit and power. And if you can't find a way to access it, you're well and truly screwed because we have blocked every other path and burned all the bridges. And while I have already acknowledged that we don't always hear about private lives, I think it says a lot that none of the handful we did hear about in school were gay or trans. Who draws the line and why? It turns out that Carver was not very masculine as a boy or a man. It was often attributed to illness, although he seemed to be healthy enough to live well into old age. But when I started to read about the part at Wikipedia, where they generally get into spouses and children, I was surprised to find that he never married. He had a brief and unproductive relationship with one woman, and then later in life, in his 70s in fact, he struck up a close friendship with a young man, a scientist named Austin Curtis. Certainly, a lot of people have close co-workers, especially in research areas. But what's interesting here is that Carver left the royalties from a biography to Curtis. Not something tied to their work, but a book about Carver's life. Carver died in 1943, 
And this is also interesting. After his death, the institute where they both worked quickly fired Curtis, almost as though he was tolerated due to his relationship with Carver. And while I don't mean to disparage any contributions Curtis may have made, I'm saying that if in fact Carver was, as biographer Christina Vela suggests, bisexual, then it could be that the Institute took a dim view of his relationship, but tolerated it due to Carver's prestige, and that after Carver's death, the less prestigious but still talented Curtis was finally hit with the homophobic bigotry that the Institute had been waiting to unleash. Firing Carver would have drawn attention. Firing Curtis, not so much. One clue about why we didn't hear about this in school can be found in the talk section at Wikipedia. This is where you can read about suggested edits that were accepted or declined, and if you go there for Carver, you see several requests to erase his sexuality by people who seem pretty offended that it would even be suggested that Carver was bisexual. Ironically, the reasons why this isn't deleted from the article are in those discussions, showing that there really is good cause to suggest this. But in my random reading on historic figures, you need to take some cues from people's lives, because people weren't allowed to live openly and authentically. It's rare to find someone actually writing about their experiences as genderqueer or non cishet normative. Most people weren't trying to advertise that they were not cishet normative and were actively motivated to hide that. And the modern day talk section shows that these stigmas exist even to the present day, when far more people are able to live openly and authentically. So it was hidden in the past and not talked about in education and still stigmatized today, where modern homophobes are still trying to erase it using the exact same closeted defense that people in the past were forced to endure. Their forced silence. People want to use this as evidence to erase them even to this day. So erase them at the time with fear, then use that erasure to erase them today so that you can say that only cishet people made any contributions to the world. Then teach it that way in school. Interestingly, while I was writing this, I actually remembered why I had looked up Carver several months back. I was making a point that our society capitalizes on discoveries like the ones that Carver made. We don't share them for the common good, but we closely guard them for profit, and often these empires make millionaires, and today even billionaires. It's not until it's been locked up with all the legal protections it can be that a company will then offer it for sale. For example, a recent news piece highlighted how a toddler was in a car that was carjacked. Fortunately, it could be traced by Volkswagen's carnet system. However, the owners of the vehicle had not renewed that subscription, and even with local police begging for help, the company refused to unlock the system to find the endangered child until they were given the money. And I didn't remember hearing anything about Carver making a peanut dynasty or an agricultural dynasty, so I had Googled to see what happened to his discoveries and why we have planters and skippy owned by Hormel Foods with a white male CEO, Jim Snee, or Jif Peanut Butter, owned by the Smucker Company with a white male CEO, Mark Smucker, and who wants to bet me that his last name is no coincidence? You get the picture. How did Carver make all these noteworthy discoveries and uses for peanuts and crop rotation, but there's no Carver Peanuts or Carver Peanut Butter or Carver Agriculture? No Carver food company run by a black CEO named Melissa Carver. And yes, I know, he didn't invent peanut butter. That's not my specific point. I'm talking about legacies and how they manifest differently for different people and what we're taught in school that counts as greatness. In school, they never taught me why so many prestigious white male figures went on to found what are basically first families in U.S. dynasties when this man seems to have died without a legacy beyond his own life and discoveries that went on to support agriculture and farming businesses. 
so that today we have ConAgra with white male CEO Sean Connolly or Archer Daniels Midland, a.k.a. ADM, with CEO Juan Luciano. I don't know how Juan personally identifies, and I respect however he does, but if you Google, you'll see he is certainly white passing when it comes to how he's read by others. Monsanto CEO White Male Hugh Grant, or White Male Cargill CEO Brian Sykes. I mean, this is fish in a barrel. I don't even have to try and cherry pick. Just pull up the top companies, and they provide the examples for me. So what the hell happened to Carver's prestige and legacy? Where is his empire? According to Encyclopedia Britannica, in 1940, Carver donated his life savings to the establishment of the Carver Research Foundation at Tuskegee for continuing research in agriculture. During his life, he declined an invitation to work for Thomas Edison at a salary of more than $100,000 a year. Also from Britannica, quote, Carver was evidently uninterested in the role his image played in the racial politics of the time. His great desire in later life was simply to serve humanity, and his work, which began for the sake of the poorest of the black sharecroppers, paved the way for a better life for the entire South. His efforts brought about a significant advancement in agricultural training in an era when agriculture was the largest single occupation of Americans, and he extended Tuskegee's influence throughout the South by encouraging improved farm methods, crop diversification, and soil conservation, unquote. And at Wikipedia, it notes that on his grave was written, quote, he could have added fortune to fame, but caring for neither, he found happiness and honor in being helpful to the world, The Britannica article talks a bit about how white people of Carver's day loved that attitude. And it doesn't surprise me, considering how much we gatekeep power and money. If a black man can model a life of achievement and end it with selflessness, all the better for the white counterparts who won't have to compete with that later, when they're building agricultural and peanut industries that are all about adding fortune to their fame. I was not taught to celebrate his personal relationships. I didn't hear interesting stories about his partner, Austin Curtis, the same way I heard about Martha Washington or Mary Lincoln. I wasn't taught to view his legacy of donating his fortune to improving agricultural practice, especially among struggling farmers, as success. I wasn't told in school this is how you succeed, by giving it all back to those who need it the most. No, I'm living in a society where people think, quote, I'm not ashamed and it's all about the money, unquote. Where we not only celebrate the white male power structure, but fight to become a more successful and profitable part of it. Who controls the platforms? Who controls the speech? Who decided what I would know about these people in public schools and why? Recently, a textbook publisher selling in Florida erased any mention of race from the history lesson about Rosa Parks. They said they didn't want to run afoul of Florida's anti-CRT legislation, and that was how they decided to address it, by playing it safe. Florida is pushing back to say that it's a misunderstanding, But when you threaten companies who produce history books with loss of sales, which are huge in Florida, you end up with content that reflects that fear of losing that revenue. I don't know what that lesson might actually end up looking like, but I know in Texas, for several years, we refused to call the transatlantic slave trade a slave trade. We even tried to conflate servitude with slavery. Who draws these lines, and why? These are public schools, government-funded and government-run, and they are deciding who gets platforms and why. And I have a lot more to say about it because I can't stop seeing these questions anymore. Who and why? Where is this message really coming from? 
not just the media site, but who's choosing this story over another one? Why are we getting the names of the cops who killed Terry Nichols after only a few weeks, but months later we don't have a single name of any officer in the death of Manuel Paez Tehran, who was shot 14 times by cops? We have conflicting autopsy reports, conflicting witness testimony, and forensics coming out of the same investigative body that has instructed authorities not to release information to the family. And back to Nichols, there were over a dozen people involved in that situation, but the faces that were provided to us were of five black officers. Why were the other identities held back? It's not just what is said, it's what's not said. It's how it's said, and whether what we're getting is even true. I suppose Henry Ford would be a good counterexample. A white man who is historically famous and a standard part of the classroom curriculum, especially around mechanization and assembly lines and mass production going through the industrial era. I honestly couldn't tell you anything about his personal life or history outside of the auto industry. I don't recall reading about his wife, his family, his beliefs or attitudes. So he's definitely one of those examples that's unlike Washington or Lincoln or Jefferson. He's recognized strictly for his business contributions. And if you ask most folks in the U.S. who invented the automobile, they'll all be able to tell you it was Henry Ford. Except it wasn't. While there were many attempts at self-propelled vehicle, the modern concept of the auto is attributed to a German named Carl Benz. That's Benz, as in Mercedes-Benz. And I'm not suggesting that nobody listening right now knows this. I'm sure some folks do. But I'm also betting there are a lot of folks listening right now who are thinking, what? At the Live Science website, Tom Standage, author of A Brief History of Motion, From the Wheel to the Car to What Comes Next, is quoted as saying, We generally think of the 1886 Benz patent motor wagon as the first proper car. Carl Benz built an entirely new vehicle around an internal combustion engine and used bicycle parts to do it. It was really a motorized bicycle, so this is what makes the car interesting. Its innovation required lots of people to try different things, and although it seems obvious in retrospect, it wasn't at the time. End quote. I don't think they lied to us in school. I actually think it was one of those situations where the textbooks were probably technically correct, but left a lot of students with an impression that Ford built the first autos, rather than that he was key to creating early U.S. autos and mainly contributed to process as his mark on the world. But I recently had a look at Ford's personal life, and I'm starting to think I might know why we didn't hear much about that in school, or at least I don't recall learning it for whatever reason. But Henry Ford was the Marjorie Taylor Greene of his day. A fierce Nazi sympathizer and anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist. Historian Bradley Hart, author of Hitler's American Friends, the Third Reich's Supporters in the United States, says... Quote, Over the past century, Ford has become one of the most iconic American brands, from its line of pickup trucks to the Mustang. The car company's first car, the Model T, broke ground and helped create the modern automotive industry. Yet what few people know today is that the company's founder, Henry Ford, not only held deeply prejudiced personal views, but also became one of Hitler's key American friends in the years before the war. To its credit, the Ford Motor Company has made some effort to come to terms with this troubling history, but there's still more work to be done. As we'll see, Ford's views were more than just a private matter. They translated into real-world action that had a major effect on Germany's military preparedness before World War II. Certainly, Ford was far from the only American businessman who was enticed by Nazi Germany. His rival, General Motors, had a German division of its own, and manufactured aircraft parts for the Luftwaffe. Yet Ford's story is unique, not just because he did extensive business in the Third Reich, but because of the influence he held over Hitler's other American friends in the United States. This industrial leader was far more than just a mere businessman. He was also an American icon who, like his friend Charles Lindbergh, who we'll discuss in the final part of this miniseries, would become practically obsessed with Hitler and Nazism. End quote. And now I have to stop and take stock of the fact that Lindbergh was considered a U.S. hero, 
and now I'm wondering what might come crawling out from under that rock if I turn it over. So I literally just stopped typing to Google this, and the first hit is an article titled How Charles Lindbergh Wrecked His Legacy, Pushing Anti-Semitism and Neutrality Toward the Nazis. It's like the hole with no bottom. Money, power, and oppressors like red, white, and blue. I'll bookmark that one for another day. So back to Ford. Still at Hart's sight, he says, The Fuhrer once indicated his desire to help Heinrich Ford become, quote, the leader of the growing fascist movement in America. He opposed U.S. entry in World War I and later adopted the view that the war had been caused by an international plot by Jewish bankers. Conspiracy theories have always been a key component of anti-Semitism, and once one begins to believe one theory, they tend to believe more and more. Anti-Semitic slurs become common in Ford's conversations, and in the early 1920s, he owned a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent that he changed into a viciously anti-Semitic mouthpiece. He began personally distributing huge numbers of the infamous anti-Semitic tract The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. A few years later, he was eventually forced to apologize to the country's Jewish community after losing a libel suit, but it seems that his own views were unchanged. By the mid-1930s, Ford was blaming, quote, financiers and moneylenders, unquote, for both the New Deal and the prospect of another world war. One of his many admirers was Hitler himself, end quote from Hart's passage. I mean, for me, this is like my disillusionment with the Founding Fathers and the mass fantasy that they were really all about liberty, freedom, and justice for all. The oppression was never hidden from me, just like my conservative church pushed me to read the Bible. They weren't hiding it. They just wanted to carefully curate how I interpreted what I was reading. They were drawing the lines, and I think we know why. As a nation, we soft-sold slavery with Thomas Jefferson. We put Andrew Jackson's face on the $20 bill. What does that communicate to indigenous people who endured the Trail of Tears, which was a literal illegal death march? We put our political leaders on pedestals and we downplay their atrocities. We excuse them the same way religious people excuse religious histories. We're told that the people back then just didn't know any better. And what we mean by that is the people in power didn't want to know better. Because the people suffering under it ended up fighting for those rights that they were denied. So it wasn't people that didn't know better. It was that people in power didn't want to listen to the people telling them that this wasn't okay. They had the power. They didn't have to listen. And now, more and more... I'm hearing about the private lives of our celebrated historic figures and thinking, what the hell? My school curriculum tells me about George Washington Carver and crop rotation and something-something peanuts, but leaves out that he was probably an example of a queer contribution to history, not just black. They don't tell me that he valued contributions over money and that he felt like giving back was more important than getting rich. My school tells me Jefferson enslaved people, you know, like a lot of people back in the day. But they forget to note that he kept a young girl who was most likely his sister-in-law as his personal sex slave in the very house where he lived with his wife and her sister. I'm told Ford was key to auto manufacture but not that he was good buddies with Hitler and that the Fuhrer wanted him to lead the fascist U.S. movement where Ford was so far down the Nazi conspiracy hole that he made Marjorie Taylor Greene look like a serious stateswoman. I'm thinking that maybe if we learned more about the reality of our history, we'd be able to see some of the things we're looking at today not as some weird anomaly, but as an ongoing pattern of behavior by the ruling class, whether that class is part of the government or part of an oligarchy that seems to be creating an ever-widening class divide. It looks as though where we're headed is back to where we were before. We just 
have not been, as a nation, completely honest about it. So, I'm asking you to think about who draws those lines, and why. That's it for this episode of At Home in My Head, exploring experience and meaning in individuals and the broader society. Like and subscribe if you enjoy these talks. And in the meantime, stay safe, be well, and never stop exploring.